in this episode I am joined by Mike and Brian, creators of Destined, to hear about their approach to some new skills, including investigation, and I talk about some new skills which we are exploring within our own campaign. Welcome to Mithras Matters, Season 1, Episode 23, Investigation, Interrogation and Memory Checks. And welcome to April. With the majority of our clocks springing forward an hour here in the Northern Hemisphere, we are moving steadfastly towards the summer months and warmer weather and sunshine. Of course, if you live in the Southern Hemisphere, then winter is on its way, so it'll soon be time to break out those woolly jumpers. I always have to remember that this podcast is listened to around the world. Although the majority of the downloads are from North America and Europe, if you're listening to this in South America, Australia and New Zealand and Asia, then thanks for the download. The podcast company where I host Mithras Matters gives me some great statistics about each and every episode. So I do know that we even have some downloads in Africa. Only five, but I hope you are enjoying the content. Okay, I would like to start this podcast episode with an announcement. Have you just paid more attention to my dulcet tones? Well, it's not a major announcement. It's just to say that this is not an April Fool's episode. Now, I'm not sure whether or not this is just an English tradition or worldwide, but on the 1st of April, we try and trick each other before noon. Major companies often run fake ads and news stories, while children are always saying things like, your shoelace is undone, even if it's not. If you fall for these jokes, then you are an April fool. But if you try to fool someone after noon, then the joke is on you. It was while thinking about April Fools that I started to think whether we actually use festivals within our own campaigns. I know in a lot of MMOs on the internet, there are festivals which can be celebrated throughout the year with both goodies and presents available. But do we use these in our own role playing? I can see the appeal of these and they could lead to a variety of encounters and events. In the recent Leoness game we played with Loz as the GM, we experienced the rivalry and intrigue of the festival which happens annually between the villages of High and Low Dudgeon. If you haven't seen the gameplay, then it is on my YouTube channel and you can buy the actual adventure from all the usual online stores. It can easily be adapted to any campaign and allows the players to get involved in a range of events, including donkey jousting and juggling cats. When I'm joined by Brian and Mike later on in this episode, we will be having a chat about skills and how they are being tackled in Destined. But to start off with, I wanted to share with you some possible new skills which we are trying out in our own campaign. In the past, I've played, well, GM'd, both Call of Cthulhu and Shadowrun. And although the settings are both very different to each other and our current fantasy campaign, the two games have some skills which I found useful while GMing sessions. These are not actual skills which the players can invest skill points in or even change at character development. They are what I would call static skills. So the skills which we are currently exploring are Memory from Shadowrun and the Ideal Role from Call of Cthulhu. 
You might already use a standard skill to replicate the effects of these two new skills, but I found that this meant that they could be developed via skill roles, something which I did not want to happen. So what do the two skills do and how are they calculated? Okay, first up, memory. This is a skill that is described very well by its name. Essentially, it is a skill role which allows the characters to remember something which they have seen, read or even heard. I often use this role when the player's own memory is failing, even through the aid of their notes. Or I might use it to provide more information about an encounter once the players have progressed further through the plotline. For example, they might be talking to a tavern owner about the local legend of the huge roaming boar and then later notice that they have someone following them. A memory role could be used at this point if the player says, was this person in the tavern when we were talking to the owner? I found it very useful to provide additional pieces of information and to make connections between different encounters. The idea role is a skill role which is used when players are stuck. We have all had those moments when we are finding it difficult to piece together the information or need some support as to what to do next. This is where the idea role comes in. Basically, a player can roll this skill and depending on their success, you as the GM can provide them a clue or an idea where to go next. I find that it's really useful as a last resort when the players are really stuck, but it can also be used for characters to see connections between main plot lines. Seeing how everything is connected is often very important in my sessions, since I go for a more murder mystery vibe in my adventures rather than the hack and slay approach. Memory is calculated by multiplying the character's intelligence by five to give a percentage, while the idea role is the average of the character's intelligence and power scores then multiplied by five. You can either have a go at using them straight away in your campaign or just consider times within your sessions when these roles could be used. Of course, I need to say at this point that these are not official new skills, just ideas which we are using in our campaign. And if you have any views about these skills or if you use some of your own new skills, then please do add them in the comments below in on the Tapper Talk discussion forums. The link will be in the show notes. Okay, time for some more new skills as I'm joined by Mike and Brian as we talk about some new skills in the new game Destined. Uh, my name is Mike Laramore. I'm one of the co-writers of Destined. And I am Brian Pivik. Hello again. I'm the uh, managing editor of TDM and also the other co-author of Destined. Fantastic. It's brilliant to have you back on the podcast. And one of the reasons of to invite you back is that I've heard some new ideas and new rules and systems coming out with Destin. Now, am I right in thinking that Destin will be like a standalone game? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things that uh, Laws wanted to do when we initially started kicking this off is just make it a standalone game um, and make it so that you don't have to necessarily like look back and forth between the rule set of Mithras or Mithras Imperative, et cetera, to, to kind of get the, the basis for it. So, uh, you know, he said, let's, let's make it a complete standalone game that uh, will be uh, featuring the rule set of Mithras. Of course, it will be D100 based, but uh, it will be a standalone game. It's, it's, you don't need necessarily Mithras itself to run the game. Fantastic. And, and, yeah, and fundamentally, the rules are familiar. If you're familiar with Mithras, then you're familiar with Destin. Um, with, there's a couple rule tweaks and additions and little things here and there, but fundamentally, it's the exact same system. 
So when when uh, Mithras Companion came out, we had some new rules for various aspects like the social conflict rules and the the chase that's um, chase rules that actually brought rules that were in different companions or different rule sets into Mithra. So are there any new rules or skills that will be new to Destin? Um, I think one thing that we emphasize a bit more in Destined over the core Mithras rules is there's the idea of task rounds, which is the equipment chapter. And, and there's a discussion as far as improving and building equipment, things like that. And it was, you know, the system where you make multiple skill checks and try to reach 100%. And we really nice. liked that and expanded on it quite a bit. And from that came some different systems that we thought were really important for a superhero game. Um, we actually have kind of a watered down, uh, simpler chase rules, but we also reference the companion because uh, I think those rules are fantastic. Mm. Uh, but one of the two of the things that really kind of came out of that were the idea of interrogation, because it's a very important part, you know, getting information from people that might be vital in your exploits and then investigation, because a lot of times in comic books, especially there are mysteries to be solved. You have to figure out what the evil plan is. You have to decide, you know, what your approach is by getting information. So we thought it was good to expand upon that a bit in that, these roles and given their own system. That that's brilliant because I'm in the Mithras campaign that we will run, we often have a legwork it's time when people go and visit their contacts in Lindo, which is the main town, and start to investigate or collect information. So let, let's start with investigation then. How? What's the rules for investigation? What is that based on? And how do we roll and complete it? Uh, in terms of investigation, um, we both of the systems are based on that. We, we call them um, extended tasks, but the task rounds. And... With investigation, I know Brian brought this up throughout the process, is the idea that we wanted to follow suit with, um, I think, actually Gumshoe, you know, in terms of yeah. casting the runes. It's a very important part of that. Um, and he had mentioned uh, something that he had found on a website called The Alexandrian, which talked about the three clues role. And the idea that in a role-playing game, that's where things kind of go off the rails is as we all know, our dice always roll perfectly. Um, we always roll a critical success every time. So we never have any failures. And we all know that's absolutely completely untrue is that right. that usually is what <laughs> throws it off the worst is you've got a group of players all trying to search an environment, make a perception check, do whatever they're supposed to be doing. And the dice are just not cooperating. So either the GM has to figure out another way around it yeah. or end up... <laughs> basically just giving out the information and you know the idea here is that in investigation there's always at least some kind of clue at the basis of it there's always some kind of information that the players will have access to but then past that you know it's analyzing the clue that you have finding additional clues finding you know additional research to help you so we talk about the different approaches that people can have when they're investigating. You know, you can canvas an area. You can go ask locals. You can go gather information from people in, in the area. You know, think of it if there was a murder in an apartment building, you're going to question everybody who lives yeah. there to see if they heard or saw anything. Um, there's crime scene investigation, you know, where you're at the scene of the crime. Um, I remember even in agony next to see that i had a an encounter there which specifically was revolved around that is investigating uh, a dead police officer yeah. and getting clues from that um there's analyzing the evidence that you have that you have to go in and look at the clues that you have and try to figure out something from it you find a matchbook at a crime scene you, you know you have to figure out you know are there fingerprints on it it's just something you can glean from that that you can use as additional information to kind of spur on the adventure uh, interrogation, which we'll talk about afterwards, but that's also a good way of process investigation, uh, researching, you know, going through and going through old records, searching the internet, finding different things, you know, that you can find out through that. And then of course the ever classic stakeout, which, oh, you know, nice. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and actually oddly enough, whenever I was going through that section, I have a friend who's a police officer. So we had quite a few discussions about that. So, you know, the, I use a lot of information he provided, in some of our discussion of these different techniques throughout the process. So 
It sounds absolutely fantastic. And I really like the idea that it's almost like um, scene based and the roles are taking place within that scene. So is there, do, will the superheroes, will the heroes um, roll dice and get a success and that's how much information they give or is it more accumulative as they roll their dice and get the information? Yeah, as, as Mike said, it, it, it's, it's based around the idea of uh, task rounds and the, the continual completion of something. And this can also stand for like a long, a long running sort of secret that is in, oh, you know, nice. in the background of the campaign, not just, you know, a, a small investigation of, let's say, you know, a robbery. Um, so, yeah, essentially what, what you would do is you would have a number of, of roles um, you can obviously use your, your luck points. Um, and then once you attain a certain percentage up to 100, then at that 100%, then, you know, the full sort of secret is revealed. Um, but yeah, it's, it's essentially based around that, that same system that's uh, in Mithras. Right. Yeah. And e even a partial success will get you something. You know, mm -hmm. in most cases, and I like Brian that you mentioned that ongoing investigation because that's something we discussed is the idea that sometimes you know you're not going to find out the clue to a broader mystery during the course of a single adventure. You know, it may be yeah. something where you're getting little bits and pieces along the way that might lead to an uber villain. You know, the villain that is the the threat manipulating everyone else that you've been facing, or you might find out another organization's involved, but you're only getting pieces here and there. So you know, even through the course of an entire campaign. You know, you could have this ongoing investigation and, you know, every time you stumble upon a clue that's related to it, you might make a check and it might contribute to it. Or if you fail, you don't quite contribute, you know, to that success level then, but then later on down the road, something else might occur. So when you reach that 100%, you could have it that that's when the, the true villains reveal, the true mystery is solved. You know, it might take six months, you know, of gameplay, but I like the idea of building up to that, you know, and having a system in place for it. I, I love that idea because I like to run um, character storylines that are individual to them that run within the campaign. And I see that as a wonderful way for them to continually investigate their, their own storylines, uh, both in the game and, and without it. So, so what about interrogation? Because I often, when people say interrogation, I always see bright lights and you know thumb screws or something like that what's what's that about well we, we wanted to make sure that you know interrogation was something that was you know sort of the purpose of the game itself rather than just interrogation for the sake of interrogation i think we even have a note in there about how we don't you know we don't want to encourage like the explicit uh, sort of torture sort of thing that, go, that goes on sometimes in films and things like that, because that's not really fun for anyone. Um, so Mike, you might want to explain a little bit more about interrogation itself. Essentially right. it's, it is, it is like investigation, um, but it's specifically for, you know, a, a person that you're talking with. Oh, yeah. And it's, I think, ultimately about your approach is that to me, interrogation is like you said, you know, we, we tend to think of that, you know, good cop, bad cop, you know, the one yeah. light in the, you know, the room, the room inside of a police station. Um, and, you know, it, and it's more to that, you know, interrogation can be trickering somebody, you know, into giving out information they don't want to give. It could be about, you know, persuading somebody, you know to the greater good of the situation. You know, you need to give up the location of the bomb or millions of people will die. It could be about, well, intimidating them, you know, hanging them off mm -hmm. a rooftop by an ankle, you know, classic superhero way of doing things. Um, and then it could also be simply be beating on them until they tell you what you want yeah. to know. And obviously we talk about that. That's not always the best approach, but in a comic book you know, scenario, it's oftentimes what happens. So, you know, you have to decide how you're going to approach the situation. And, you know, are you going to try to wine and dine somebody? Are you going to try to trick them to give out the information at a dinner party? Um, and then that's how the game master will determine what skills are needed, how you're going to deal with the approach. Um, you have to take the situation into account. You know, if you have just beat up every single <laughs> member of a gang's 
you know, group except for one, and he's the last one, and there's four superheroes sitting over him, that's probably going to make him a little more motivated to talk to you all. Yeah. Or if, you know, you happen to know a piece of, of secret information about them and threaten to blackmail them with it, or, you know, whatever you're trying to do to get that out of them, that will change the difficulty of the role, good or bad, you know, and it's using those things to determine, you know, how the social interaction will go, how you'll deal with the <clears throat> resistance that they have in terms of not giving out the information and what the outcome is ultimately going to be in terms of what information will they reveal. Will they try to lie to you about what they know and give you false information? So, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's it's more encompassing than just the, the standard, you know, it crime sounds, scene. Yeah. You know? Hey, it sounds it. And I, I think the system sounds absolutely brilliant. I really think it has that that depth and that link to the the narrative that often comes along with superhero you know storylines or comics or even um films a matter for that and i, I think that really um, mirrors that and will promote that atmosphere of a real superhero game um what what you know when we're talking about skills and also to some extent powers as well. Are there are there characteristics, you know, like in Mithras, certain characteristics go to certain skills. Will that be the same with Destined? Will certain characteristics go to certain skills and certain characteristics go to certain powers or is there a different system altogether? So as far as skills, uh, essentially we have taken them like, sort of a modern approach that you might find in something like White Death uh, regarding the, the relationship of the skills to uh, the world. Obviously, it's not a fantasy world, so some of the skills are more modernized, like computers and things like that. Uh, but yeah, essentially, that remains the same. Uh, one of the changes that we made fairly recently is, is linking the characteristics to specific powers. And uh, that was suggested to us uh, from Pete, uh, Pete Nash, who is a, a, a great guy to work with. Um, mm -hmm. And he is sort of like a, a, uh, a rule savant in many, many ways. Um, and one of the suggestions that he had was to link the characteristics, pow, uh, strength, charisma, et cetera, to specific powers. So one of the recent changes and, and one of the other reasons why the book is still in process is because we have been making uh, massive changes to the way uh, the relationship between characteristics and powers. And I think that the new system is really great in reflecting, uh, you know, a person who has a really high charisma will have, be better at certain powers than other powers. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it, it really helps balance the system quite, quite well. Yeah, and, and it kind of means that you have to diversify your characteristics more. Mm -hmm. You know, in the previous system, you know, PAL became very easy as, a, as kind of a dump stat that, you know, you want to put as much many points into as possible because it was very important and we don't want, you know, people min-maxing their characters. No, yeah. you know, it's going to happen no matter what. I've just been gaming too long to know that no matter what your system, <laughs> someone somewhere is going to figure out yes. a way to game your system. But that's, a, you know, that's OK. It's we didn't want to make it any easier for people to do. But it, it kind of really does reflect, you know, what the power reflects in terms of what it's supposed to do. You know, like con is linked to inherent armor and, you know, the strength, obviously, you know, is linked to enhanced strength. So it kind of, you know fits your character you know you, you don't have a character with an eight strength who has you know super strength you know it's probably not going to be the best match mm. but it, it really does I, th I think it really kind of adds to the system and you know it gives you a good diversity in terms of you know balancing your character out in different ways and, and really deciding you know how your characteristics can really be linked to that and giving each one a role yeah in terms of the power system i i really like that because when I'm thinking about how I would run a campaign with Destined, one of the things I want to do is almost like start off with normal, you know, non-powered individuals that then migrate into their powers and evolve into their powers. So I really like that link between the characteristics and their their, their core powers that come about, which is which would be fantastic. Will the superpowers 
impact on skills as well. So if I'm suddenly super strong, will my, I don't know if there is a, like a brawn role, but would that increase because the base stat will be strength? I think we use the skills in terms of how well you use your abilities. Got so no, it, the biggest difference would be, you know, in terms of uh, enhanced strength is a good example, is that you have a, a maximum lift which is something we've added to this to the system. Um, so depending on what your strength is, it'll determine what your max lift is, both normal and enhanced. So your enhanced strength, you know, if you have a certain level, you can easily lift two tons without any effort, which means that you don't really have to make a bronze skill check oh, to yeah. do that. That's, that's the kind of thing. But we have a, a range of weight that you need to make a bronze skill check to lift that weight. So maybe twice your, your max amount requires a bronze skill check. And then if you want to really push it, you can lift even more and it might be a harder bronze skill check. So we kind of did that in terms of kind of reflecting the skills that we didn't want the skills to suddenly become, because you're super strong, you're never going to fail a bronze check because exactly. that factors yeah. into other things. You know, if you're being grappled or things like that, you know, there, there should be ways that, you know, you, you can get out of that, but your skills shouldn't automatically be you know, enhanced because of the powers. It just gives you a different way of using your skills. Mm -hmm. And the other thing too is that, you know, because Mithras is, is a highly diversified sort of system and there are so many things like, you know, special effects and mm. movement rate and all of these different things, all of those are affected by the powers, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's more than just Okay, like like Mike said, you know, because you have enhanced strength, you'll never have to roll another brawn roll. Um, it's it's yeah. much more complex than that. Um, yeah, that but I think it, it, it's complex, but it's also in in my in my play testing, I have found it to be extremely smooth the way that the system mm -hmm. works. So it's it's not like you're having to you know do a ton of mathematics on on the side. Right, Brilliant. and also to make sure that everything else for Mithras integrates very easily into Dustin. So there's not a big change in terms of how we operate in terms of skills or how we operate in terms of combat that you can play a character from base Mithras or you can play a character from after the Vampire Wars or you can play something, you know, that comes from another game within the same line or M space, you know, that mm. will fit very neatly into Dustin or you can integrate those powers and other things into your other games you know, very easily because it's all the same system. Uh, what one of the questions I would like to ask, but you might not be able to answer it, is that I noticed that when Mithras, um, the rule set, people are very aware of their action points uh, because they can get more by putting it into certain stats. And M Space actually says, no, you have two action points. Everybody has two action points and that's it. Whereabouts is Destin going? <laughs> If you could say, <laughs> um, we're we're kind of both. Uh, I think we have a suggestion for uh, just a standard amount of action points, depending on your power level, and then you know the standard derived system from the main book. Uh, the one thing I will say is some of the powers do grant you the ability through the boosts to have bonus action points, but they're usually only for specific actions. So. You know, if you have enhanced speed, you might get an action point to do a movement, you know, or if you have combat expert, you might be able to make an additional attack or you have, you know, ability to have an additional parry or dodge. So there, it, you can gain extra action points by spending power points on the boost, but they're not just a, an action point you can use for anything. It's very much tied to the power that grants you the, the ability to do that. I I would love to spend time now um, you telling us all the powers that are in the book, but that, I, I understand that that would be a very lengthy <clears throat> podcast, but I wonder whether or not you could, um, to get a feel of Destined, whether or not you can, you mentioned, Brian, that, you know, that play testing has happened. What sort of characters have been created with the powers? Um, so I ran two playtest games, uh, one where I essentially let my, my two players choose whatever sort of uh, powers they would like to have. 
Um, and I think, I think in a prior episode, I kind of talked about that, but I'll talk about my more recent game a little yeah. bit more in depth. Um, essentially, I, I stole an idea from Mike about uh, letting my characters uh, kind of wake up in a, in a, like a laboratory, essentially, and they're trying to figure out who they are and, and why they were there. They have a certain number of powers. I think they have one or two each, and then eventually they're going to start realizing they have these other powers. Um, and I told my, my players, I was, you know, I said, if you would like to roll randomly on a, on a wonderful table that we put together in the back of the book, uh, and you can just have two random powers, uh, they all opted to actually do that. So mm. they have a, a wide disparity of, of <laughs> powers that are really fun to work with. They're not like, you know, okay, one guy is going to be the Flash. One guy is going to be Batman. Exactly, Batman, yeah. New Lantern. Um, so th that, that sort of randomness that we introduced was a really fun way to play. Um, the characters really developed and are developing right now because of their origins. And Mike, you probably have something more to add about that, but the origins essentially were originally like a narrative uh, uh, design for the, for the system itself. And more recently, we've, we've started to make the origins uh, have more of an influence over the actual character. So... Yeah, that was, that was actually Mike. yeah. <laughs> but that was actually another suggestion from Pete. Is mm -hmm. we we had talked. You know, originally it was based on your power, and he had offered some suggestions about alternate systems. And we actually kind of liked one of the alternate systems we came up with better than the original system. So we made that change in the final draft. And essentially, you know, each origin is linked to a characteristic, and that characteristic is used to determine how many powers you start with. So if you're a mutant, you know, it might be your constitution. If you're psychic, it might be your charisma. You know, it's different things that your characteristics yeah. also influence your powers as well. Um, and I really like that. I feel like it, it really kind of makes the origin more significant. That You know, yeah, it is tied very much to your background, and, and we have... Um, background event tables which are linked to each origin so you know if you are an inherent powers you know when you're born with it like someone like aquaman you know that there's a whole list of you know background events that could give you some you know inspiration for your character and it, it kind of adds to that too you know that your background is is even more significant now in determining the course for your character but we also talk about in terms of, you know that as a game master you may not want people to have you know random differences in powers you know because of their characteristics you know this guy has five powers this guy has two powers so there's also the option that everyone across the board can have you know a certain number of powers based on the power level of the campaign so if you're street level everyone might start with a single power while if you're paragon everyone might start with five or six mm. you know that's up to the game master and the group to determine that so you can really craft the superheroes that you want to and make sure everyone feels like they're getting a chance to shine you know and have the ability to have access to cool powers and abilities i i really like that connection to the origin i think that's really powerful uh in the sense that and um, players will be creating a character that almost like develops into a hero and i i must admit uh, Brian, I'm going to nick Mike's idea as well. And when I play the game, they, they are going to randomly roll them because I, I think there's something quite refreshing about that because I don't want everybody to be super strong or everybody to be super fast. I, I want that variation across the group. And I think it's, you know, if you... We've all got really good role players in the group who will be able to take that on board and actually run with it so so that's very exciting has your play testing been good mike we'll hear more about mike's play testing and more about destined in the second part of this interview which will feature in may's episode of mithras matters Remember, if you would like to contribute to the podcast, then why not drop me an email or message and let me know what you would like to cover. I'm always looking for reviews or interviews with people. So if you're interested, 
then you can email me at inwills at gmail.com or send me a message on the various forums I frequent. Also, if you are interested, then remember you can watch my other content on my YouTube channel where I explain the rules of Mithras, including some newly published shorter and more focused videos. I post actual play videos and also talk about GMing in my series, The Gibbering GM. Likes, subs and comments are always gratefully received and I try to reply to all the comments that you post. And that's it, another episode of Mithras Matters completed. Next month, we will continue to chat with Brian and Mike with a focus on money and how this can be used and adapted in your campaigns. And if you're interested in money, then keep an eye open for the next short rules video on my YouTube channel, which will be featuring bartering and haggling. So until next time, have a great month of gaming and I will chat to you all again in May. Until then, I hope all your opposed worlds succeed and provide you with a well-deserved special. Thanks for listening, everyone. See ya. Bye. The content of this podcast is covered by the Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license, so please give appropriate credit if you are sharing or copying any part of this podcast. Thank you.